So I, I hope it's not too late in the afternoon to introduce um, some um, reflections on the philosophical underpinnings of the difficulties we see, which I think, <coughs> well, whether or not you find them interesting, you can tell me at the end, but they are nevertheless important, uh, indeed it's essential. We have to keep what's happening in its context, in its intellectual context, in the context of the development of ideas over the last century and more. Um, and that's what I'm going to try and do this evening while, while, you, while you take your well-earned rest. Um, so, um, once upon a time, um, there was a doctrine in the English law that the, while the legal character of some actions could be completely changed by the victim's consent, this was not so with others. Thus, if Adam took away the property of Beatrice, this was theft if Beatrice did not consent, but it not theft if Beatrice did consent. On the other hand, if Adam caused Beatrice actual bodily harm or killed her, it made no difference if Beatrice consented. Adam could waive any kind of signed or sworn declaration from Beatrice that she wanted him to do what he had done in front of judge and jury, and they would find him guilty all the same. Now, many people will tell us that we live in a more enlightened age. If B is tired of life or wants to experience being harmed, we are well on her way to her consent being alone enough to make it legally and indeed, uh, for many people, morally permissible. The fast-moving world of bioethics has already gone beyond this simple idea. Now patients are killed without their consent as well as with it, and doctors are increasingly obliged to harm their patients, if the patient should demand it, um, or if it's thought to be a good idea. First in the case of abortion, but soon in that of gender dysphoria um, with body integrity disorder, um, which is when people uh, want healthy limbs amputated, a little further down the road. Once you get rid of the, the traditional prohibition on killing in cases where the victim consents, why, after all, stop that? Why not move on to cases where the victim does not consent to be killed, but where duly authorised people think that it would be a good thing to kill him <coughs> regardless? This is the direction in which the legal and medical establishment is inclined to go under the influence of utilitarianism. It can't be exaggerated how important uh, utilitarianism has been um, as an influence on the law. So utilitarianism being the view that um, we should do, we must do, we are obliged to do, whatever brings about the best consequences. For lawyers and doctors, the ultimate goal is bringing about good outcomes, not personal autonomy. The good outcomes are themselves measured in utilitarian terms, which means in terms of satisfying as many preferences as possible. This may not, of course, uh, be in accordance with the preference of the person who is being acted upon, um, which is why you have uh, involuntary euthanasia um, and so on. The educational establishment, on the other hand, seems content to rest at the intermediate stage of conceptual development that, con that consent is indeed the key. Consent must be mutual to be outcomes, good, bad or indifferent. This attitude is very much on display from social workers in the new, now numerous reports of public inquiries into child sex abuse rings. The pattern is that they acknowledge that the child victims of abuse were making terrible choices, which is a phrase that I've heard, at least one of those. Um, but this fact doesn't warrant intervention. On the contrary, they saw it as their job to prevent parents from intervening. Consent is everything and outcomes can go hang. In this presentation, I want to explore the way in which consent is being used here, where it comes from, what it implies, and how it interacts with other aspects of morality, both traditional and progressive, and how it works in practice. The first question is where it comes from. As I've already indicated, the appeal to consent is a substitute for the prohibitions of traditional morality and law not to kill, for example, or to restrict sex to marriage. Such prohibitions have long been attacked for restricting our freedom. Before the end of the 18th century, William Blake imagined the garden of love, spoiled by the building of a chapel, which had thou shalt not written over its locked door. 
And priests in black gowns were walking their rounds and binding with briars my joys and desires. The problem with the old prohibitions, which Blake is concerned about, is not that they prevented clever and benevolent doctors and lawyers of bringing about the best possible outcomes, which is the utilitarian instinct, but rather that they impede self-realization. We might call this the romantic instinct. Romantic self-realization may, of course, involve harm to others, like Gauguin abandoning his wife and five children in order to pursue his art. It seems probable that Mrs. Gauguin's self-realization as a wife and mother was impeded by this action. One way of responding to this difficulty is to insist on mutual consent. If I want to do something, then that is presumptively okay, but if others, um, but if others are affected, then I should gain their consent. In this way, it is hoped that a world without traditional moral prohibitions will not immediately descend into a dystopian nightmare, where the strong exploit the weak. Perhaps consent can become the one and only moral principle. Perhaps we can squeeze the whole of morality out of this one idea in the same way that Jerry Bentham, the founder of utilitarianism, tried to squeeze it out of benevolence, and Immanuel Kant tried to do it with rationality. The concern with consent can in this way be set into the context of the collapse of traditional moral and cultural values. The putatively objective claims about history and English literature taught to our parents and grandparents, such as that the First World War was a just and necessary response to German aggression, or that Shakespeare sh thought the character Shylock was a bad person, uh, cannot be taught to our children because, to generalise, academics and school teachers have not only lost their confidence in those claims, but more significantly, they have lost their confidence in any putatively objective claims they might put in their place never mind reassessing the causes of the First World War or rehabilitating Shylock, uh, that's old hat. Today, there, is no, there are no true and false interpretations, just our own reaction to um, the subject. So, what do they do? They show a children a photograph of the trenches of World War I, or a poem, or a story, and ask them to emote about it. In the same way, children are presented with a prospect of sexual relations and asked what they feel about it. In each case, it is a substitute for an informed judgment based on substantive principles. People who have lost confidence in substantive moral principles are clearly not going to have any confidence in the judgments they generate. And the background information, which you'd also use in making such a judgment, becomes equally irrelevant. All we have is the reaction of the onlooker, the reader or the agent. A positive reaction makes whatever is being reacted to good, a negative one makes it bad. Naturally, what one person thinks is good, another person may think is bad, but this is no real contradiction because actually, in the end, we're dealing with matters of taste. The modern conception of consent grew up in the context of legal contracts, and in this original con context, one can lay down some tough criteria to determine whether it's actually taken place or not. The parties must know what they are doing. They must be a sound mind. They must not be under the influence of alcohol or drugs. They must be of a certain age. In some cases, we can insist that they have independent legal or financial advice. And in <coughs> cases of doubt, we might even want to see a letter from a psychiatrist affirming a patient's, uh, an agent's mental capacity. All these things are possible in the context of agreeing to complex financial transactions or marriage or major surgery, because generally speaking, it is possible to delay an agreement until all the requirements have been satisfied. Most people won't have to give or seek consent in this elaborate fashion more than a few times in their lives. If, on the other hand, consent is going to be the key issue in every day-to-day -day interaction, it is going to be a rather watered-down version, or else those interactions are going to become impossible, or perhaps both. If some kind of consent is going to be necessary to, for Adam to tell the long-suffering bee an off-colour joke in the lunch break, for example, it is pretty difficult to imagine how that can be arranged. If consent is going to be the key to whether Adam can touch B on the wrist late one evening in a bar after a few drinks, then Adam has a problem. <laughs>
Before moving on, you may be wondering what the alternative to consent as the key to those sorts of interactions might be. The answer is social convention. There is a wide consensus that some kinds of behaviour are reasonable or unreasonable, polite or rude or gallant or abusive. If we think of such a consensus as establishing rules of behaviour, this takes a lot of pressure off the concept of consent. Thus, it doesn't matter if a stranger doesn't consent to my interrupting his daydreams to ask for directions, because asking for directions from a stranger is a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Nor is it necessary for us to know that a young lady waiting for a bus does not consent to crude sexual advance from a stranger in order to say that such an advance is wrong, because we know that such an approach is inappropriately invasive and rude given its social context and content. If we can't rely on these social conventions, my asking for directions and some yob propositioning a girl at a bus stop come out as structurally parallel situations. The yob and I have the same difficulty. It would be impossible for me to gain the stranger's consent to interrupt his daydreams without interrupting his daydreams. In exactly the same way, it would be impossible for the yob to determine whether the girl consents to hearing his crude advances without making, them hear, making her hear them. I labour the point because it is so obvious that one is okay and the other is not, we can lose sight of why it is obvious. It is obvious because of social conventions. Social conventions, like the laws of warfare, apply fundamental moral principles to the complexities of real life. They evolve to meet new situations, and there is extensive moral influence, mutual influence between such conventions and the, rule, the law of the land. Even when not expressed in law, they set up our expectations and form what we regard as reasonable or unreasonable when a person's behaviour puts um, at risk his job or reputation. They aren't infallible, of course, and it is always, isn't always a simple matter to apply them to particular cases, because but they are more widely understood and endorsed than the ethical theories academic philosophers like me pride themselves on, and they are democratic in the sense that conventions are always open to criticism, renegotiation, and self-righteous defiance. Although they need make no claim on absolutism or universality, social conventions have been the victims of moral scepticism just as much as the Ten Commandments, indeed more so as they tend not to be defended so fiercely by social conservatives. This is understandable, but it has been a tactical mistake. <coughs> Something intermediate between fundamental moral principles and daily life is absolutely necessary. For example, telling young people not to break the Sixth Commandment is a wholly inadequate way of preparing them for the dating scene. Telling them to get home by 10 p.m., what it means and does not mean for a man to pay for girls' drinks, and what sort of clothing signals sexual availability are contingent and indeed arbitrary, but they are the kinds of things we need to know if we are under to understand how to obey the Sixth Commandment in our own society. There are interpretations of the Sixth Commandment for a highly specific social context with the force of custom, and they are a major component of culture. To return to the new world of, of the ethics of consent, the idea was that both fundamental moral principles and social conventions would be set aside, both because of scepticism about their validity and in the interests of personal freedom. For reasons I've already indicated, gaining consent can be difficult in everyday interactions, and this whole approach has often been ridiculed for bringing in not romantic libertinism, but its very opposite, a new puritanism. Perhaps from now on, critics say, flirtations will have to take place in the presence of a chaperone. Difficulties are particularly acute where alcohol has been consumed, and indeed, at a certain point of inebriation, it is obvious that a person cannot meaningfully consent to anything. There are, however, some people who are permanently in a cognitive state in which consent is problematic, namely the mentally handicapped and children. The educational establishment and social services, however, do not want to hear that their charges are incapable of giving consent. <laughs> 
The object of the exercise was to loosen the bonds of traditional moral pro prohibitions, not to tighten them. They want the individuals under their charge to be able to do whatever they like. Given the limitations on their agency, however, this tends to mean that they want their charges to do whatever they themselves want them to do. Whether this is self-stimulation or attending climate demonstrations, teachers and social workers can claim that their charges have consented while ensuring that they are exposed to only one side of any argument. Even for people with normal adult mental faculties, an artificial information environment of this nature would be enough to undermine the moral significance of such consent. This weakening of the notion of consent is not consistently applied. The stereotypical undergraduate rugby lad is told that he can do anything if everyone consents, but that a few glasses of wine effectively mean that he can't do anything. School teachers, school nurses and social workers, on the other hand, are told that they can infer a child's consent to sexual relations and to abortion on the basis of a decision which falls a lot more than a few glasses of wine short of an adult's informed consent because of the immaturity intrinsic to the state of childhood and because of the deliberate and selective withholding of information. This is to say nothing of social pressure to which I'm going to turn in a moment. There is a particular paradox which arises over the teaching of the teaching of the ethics of consent. As I have explained, the theory of consent has the ambition of taking over large areas of morality, if not the whole of it, and schools set themselves the task of teaching it to children. This requires a critique of any other basis upon which behaviour, especially sexual behaviour, can be criticised or justified. Thus we get the now notorious Stonewall lesson plans designed to humiliate children who are insufficiently zealous with their accusations of homophobia. These lessons, we can be sure, are acutely uncomfortable experiences for many of the children. Have they consented to these experiences? This is a question which is not asked. It seems legitimate to wonder, however, how the sacred importance of consent can be taught effectively in a class which itself violates the principle of consent. In this way, we can begin to see a strange alliance between the ethics of consent and behaviour which is actually abusive. It is to this which I now turn. The replacement of substantive moral principles and social conventions with consent has not brought in quite the liberated idyll that some hoped. The public inquiry into the Oxford sex abuse ring noted, among other things, that the desire among teachers and social workers to avoid value judgments about sexual behaviour created, and I quote, an environment where it is easier for vulnerable young people stroke children to be exploited. It also makes it harder for professionals to have the confidence and bravery to be more proactive on prevention and intervention, unquote. So here's an interesting example of the uh, uncomfortable interface between the world of education and social work on the one hand and the world of law on the other with a very different perspective on things. This was about the so sexual exploitation of children by adults. Of equal concern is the abuse of children by each other. In 2017, the BBC revealed that over the previous three years, police in England and Wales received reports of 2,625 sexual offences in schools, including 225 alleged rapes. This, that is, 23 offences for every school week. One can only imagine the number of sexual assaults which were not reported, which in many schools are simply endemic. One piece of research quoted, re reported, and I quote, I was in a French lesson in year eight, that's age 12, one girl told researchers, and a boy sitting next to me kept groping my bum and tried moving his hand to my front, unquote. They think that they can touch us whenever they like, said another. They slap our butts and touch our breasts. You quote, they lift up our skirts and whistle. You quote, they touch girls in corridors, at lunch and at break times, said a teacher. And they think, and they all seem to think that it's just normal. End of quotation. This particular report was published by a 
group called UK Feminista, which looks at the phenomenon through the lens of sexism. They focus exclusively, therefore, on the abuse of girls by boys. This is, however, only one facet of the situation. For example, pressure to engage in premature sexual activity is exerted on both girls and boys by members of their own sex and peer group. The broader picture is that telling children that there are no more rules, that everything is permitted, that the adults in charge will never judge you, and that there are no effective mechanisms of discipline, has not made children into little angels who never hurt each other or never get drawn into abusive relationships. Are not children also taught that consent is necessary for actions to be okay? Yes, they are. But this important qualification to the moral nihilism of the educational establishment doesn't seem to be holding back the tide of sexual exploitation. The fact is, as I have already indicated, the official view that consent is necessary for every single interaction is completely unworkable and therefore simply cannot become an established part of children's social lives. However many lessons on consent they are taught, Furthermore, when sexually abusive children are picked up on their behaviour, they tend to claim that they thought their victim consented. This ter turns a sexual assault into an unfortunate misunderstanding. Here is another quotation from the same report. Why didn't you stop when she was crying? A teacher asked a 14-year-old perpetrator. And he replied, it's normal for girls to cry during sex. There is, however, more to say about the effect of the ethics of consent upon the culture of schools, which I want to approach in a slightly different way. From time to time, I give talks about philosophy in schools, and on one occasion, not long ago, I arrived at a private school in London to find the headmaster somewhat agitated about my talk. It seems that a previous speaker, a Catholic priest, had caused discomfort among the pupils, and he didn't want it to happen again. I was able to reassure him that the topic I had prepared didn't stray into issues of personal morality, so the situation did not really arise. But in the course of our conversation, one remark of his struck me. He said that the pupils felt under tremendous pressure. The problem with the earlier talk had been that it increased their feeling of pressure. What I think he meant was this. Schools are conformist environments. We can all remember peer pressure to dress in certain ways, for example. In some schools, there's pressure not to work too hard. This peer pressure may well be counter to various kinds of pressure being applied by teachers and parents. The school conformist likes to think of himself as a rebel. Now, there is pressure to act sexually in certain ways, and it can be intense. There is counter-pressure from what we might call the natural sexual reserve of children. What the headmaster was worried about is that I would say something which would make pupils feel guilty about what they had done or what they were contemplating doing, that I would increase one side of the pressure, making my, their dilemma more painful. Now, the entire tenor of modern education, I don't say of sex education, but of education in general, is that sexual reserve is irrational. Because after all, any and all sexual behavior is okay if it's consensual. In other words, it tells children that if they feel bad about sexual activity, their feelings have no objective justification. They are just feelings. In theory, that should make them worthy of respect. But as a matter of fact, sexual reserve is not respected. One obvious way in which it is not respected is pupils' exposure to sexually explicit material in the classroom. But even aside from that, the constantly reiterated claim that sexual reserve is just a feeling itself fails to respect it because it actually presents itself to us as a moral intuition. An intuition that some acts are objectively wrong. To respect that moral intuition would be to, would imply accepting the possibility, at least for the sake of argument, that the intuition is correct. This, however, would be incompatible with the claim fundamental to the ethics of consent that there are no valid 
moral prohibitions, and one can do anything if everyone involved consents. Schools are told, with increasing shrillness, to ensure that pupils are taught to respect every lifestyle choice. Respect here does not mean not bullying or denigrating or openly criticising other people for their decisions. It means affirming them. Recognise them as good. Good because expressive of each agent's choices and therefore part of each agent's self-expression and identity. The approved lesson plans make it clear that to think that another person's sexual behaviour is potentially susceptible to criticism on the basis of objective moral principles is incompatible with respecting such choices. The implication is that criticising others' decisions is wrong because the principles underlying such criticism is, are wrong. If the moral principles are invalid, then not only can we not use them to criticise other people's decisions, but we can't use them to criticise our own decisions either. If I am not even allowed to believe that there are objective moral principles which guide and limit my own decision-making, then I would be allowed to believe that those same principles would apply to other people's actions. That cannot be allowed. It must be conveyed to pupils instead that their feelings are just feelings. In order to establish this brave new world in which we all respect each other's lifestyle choices, the moral instincts which are common to the major world religions and form the basis of what human civilization and culture must be torn up by their roots. So where does that leave school children who find themselves under pressure to engage in sexual acts? Recall the headmaster I mentioned, who was fretting that a visiting speaker at his school might suggest that some decisions are bad for some reason. Let us imagine he manages to banish such heretical ideas from his school. Children will hear from their teachers that all sorts of lifestyles should be affirmed and celebrated. With a stress on those, which children may feel a bit uncomfortable about, with the message that their discomfort is wrong. It is difficult to avoid the implication of these lessons that sexual activity is the basis of pretty well all forms of self-realisation worthy of the name. This message will be reinforced by the Freudian narrative long absorbed by popular culture that sexual abstinence is a mark of immaturity, repression or even mental illness. It will be further leveraged by their peers in terms of what is grown up, cool and fun, and what is the opposite of these things. One might think at this point that this is not an environment in which children are encouraged to trust their own feelings and to resist pressure to act against them. Um, and that is one of the mantras of the um, sex education um, system. But this is only half the story because it is only half of the children's feelings. Sexual pressure itself creates feelings of shame, loneliness, fear, and a desire to fit in and be normal. Those feelings are no less real than the feelings of reserve. The difference is the moral basis for the feelings in each case, sexual reserve, derives, as we believe, from an instinctive knowledge of the moral law which is common to humanity. The feelings of shame and humiliation arising from being bullied and ostracised for not taking part in the sexual free-for-all of the school community, on the other hand, is an understandable reaction to a highly contingent and artificial environment, a modern British school. We are not allowed to talk about this difference, however. We are told that there is no moral basis to our feelings and no way of judging some to be more authentic witnesses of our true nature than others, unless it is a matter of shedding inhibitions. There is no reason to place the feelings of shame caused by a sexually depraved peer group into a wider context, for example, in which it might not seem quite so valid as a guide to action. Feelings are just feelings. This indeed to repeat my quotation of the report about the Oxford child abuse ring, is an environment where it is easier for vulnerable young children to be exploited. 
The net result of the competing forms of pressure is that children come to understand that feelings of reserve are barriers to full and normal participation in the school communion, sh community. Shedding them is a sign of maturity, of coming of age, and the sooner one does that, the better. This is a gift to those adults and peers who wish to engage in the sexual exploitation of vulnerable children. In the context of abortion, we have all heard this before, of course. Women in crisis pregnancies are ty typically have mixed feelings, feelings which point them in different directions. While claiming to respect women's feelings and validate their decisions, the abortion industry, including its tentacles inside schools, seeks to undermine feelings of moral compunction about abortion, leaving feelings such as financial worries in possession of the field. Anyone who attempts to alleviate the latter kind of feeling by offering practical advice or financial assistance is accused of making things more difficult for women. How often we've heard that. The contest of feelings is not much of a level playing field. You'll be pleased to hear that I'm going to wrap this up. <laughs> um, and I would like to summarise what I have said today under two headings. First, if schools want children to stop abusing each other or allowing themselves to be abused by adults, they need to stop talking about consent and talking and talk instead about inappropriate behaviour. Behaviour which is inappropriate even if the victim has been pressured and browbeaten into going along with it. As repeated court cases and public inquiries have indicated, an exclusive concern with consent places all responsibility on the child victim of abuse. If the victim caves in, to what may be intense pressure to acquiesce if alternatives to going along with abuse seem lacking or unattractive, then it is the victims who are blamed for any bad outcomes, dropping out of school, pregnancy, and so on. To state the obvious, children are no more ready for this kind of responsibility than they are ready to handle their own financial affairs. To place this kind of responsibility on children is, in fact, itself abusive. Second, if we want to prepare our children for life, not just in school but in the wider world, memorising the Ten Commandments while commendable is insufficient. Going beyond what I have said in this paper, the best way of coming to understand the place of sexuality in a complete life is to experience, as a child, a family life founded on sexual exclusivity and openness to life, a stable and loving environment where Catholic culture and spirituality are able to flourish. This is not a lesson easily learned from a textbook of moral theology. The Catholic family must be experienced, and it must seep into our bones. If we want to know what we can do about the current crisis as parents, there is always this, to live our vocation more faithfully. <laughs>